more Melnick. So our next speaker is uh, Warren Melnick uh, from Millennium Communications. Uh, Warren is the director of IT and security, and the I believe the title of his presentation is how to prepare for and successfully pass PCI compliance, HIPAA security, and similarly critical security audits. Thank you, sir. Wow. Good morning, everyone. Actually, uh, we, we went with a slightly simpler title that one might actually remember, which is how to create a good security plan. All right. It was perfect that Mark left off where he did because I'm going to talk to you today about that's good, why you need a security plan, what should be in your security plan, and how you should monitor to make sure your security plan is being followed. Okay. Ah, okay, this is beautiful. Does this have a pointer to it? It does. Awesome. Okay, so let me introduce myself first. My name is Warren Mullen. I was an attorney. I did a bunch of intellectual property stuff. I got better. I am no longer an attorney. I went back to what I started with, which was technology. I love technology. I love security. I work with a company right here in Syosset. Millennium Communications, we do a lot of hosting and security work for clients, small clients, large clients. We work with Fortune 50 banks, we work with retailers, we work with small manufacturers such as yourself here on Long Island. Um, I'm going to try to keep this talk to a half hour so that I can answer some questions afterwards. Hopefully you will have some questions because I'm going to cover some stuff that is fairly important to you. Okay, we'll start with the reasons for a good security plan. There's no time right here right now. Okay. The reasons for a good security plan. These are all the different types of vulnerabilities that you'll find out there. Okay? This first one, denial of service, is when someone hits you, your business, your website so hard from so many different places that people can't get to your website. Right? People don't think of that as a problem. They think of these breaches when people are stealing stuff. Well, you, the first way you meet a lot of your customers often is your website. So if people can't get to it, that's a denial of service. Then we get to all these other ones which are very technical. I'm going to try to keep it non-technical today as much as possible. If you look here, here's 1999. The 2019 numbers only go through January. So let's go down to 2018. All right. Mark in his presentation noted the uptick in 2016 where they added cyber attacks to the doomsday clock. Look what happened to these numbers. 2017 and 2018. All right. We jumped from 6,000 to 14 and 16,000. Cyber attacks are on the rise so quickly that even with a full-time staff, it's almost impossible to keep up with. All right, here is the same data graphed. Okay, see what's happening here? This is what happened from 2016 to 2018. Here's a list of vendors. You probably use a bunch of these. Microsoft, Oracle, IBM, Apple, Google. And the number of times that they've been compromised. I believe this is the 2018 list, because 2019 isn't out yet. From year to year, you don't see too much change. IBM and Apple flipped. Google and Cisco flipped. But aside from that, these are the people and the people's products who are being targeted. All right? Chances are every single one of you uses Microsoft Office. All right? You use Word. You use Outlook for your email. That's what's getting targeted over and over. So you have to have a security plan so that you know what you're going to do if something goes wrong and also how you're going to stop something from going wrong. All right, here's a few breaches. All right, Yahoo, three billion people had their data breached. All right, chances are you're not going to have three billion records that are breached, but it grows quickly. Now, forget about the big scary numbers. I want to point out the ones in purple. Okay? These are cyber attacks. The likelihood of them happening and the impact. 
All right? No more cyber attacks is. Okay? Also, critical information infrastructure breakdown and data fraud and theft. They're rising. They are moving up every year. All right? Here is, in terms of likelihood, cyber attacks and data fraud or theft. By the way, can you in the back hear me? I usually don't have too much problem without a mic. Okay. All right, and cyber attacks in terms of impact. Here again, forget about all the big scary things, just look to 2016 and 2017. All right, notice how high up purple is. They appeared once or twice before in 2012 and 2014, a little down here, but all of a sudden in 2018, they've jumped, 27 and 2018. Now, interestingly, what was big for a little while, you see 2016, 2017, all right, was um, large-scale uh, large intercontinental migration. So that was the Arab Spring. So that was the problem. That's gone away. Cybersecurity is not going away anytime soon. It gets worse and worse. Okay? Here's a couple of... Quick figures, and what I want to point out here, it's hard to see on this one, I'm sorry, but here is those same purple ones, and this is the way they interconnect with other problems. So if there's a critical infrastructure breakdown, all right, that causes a failure of critical infrastructure, which could cause state collapse or crisis, which could cause failure of urban planning, everything's interconnected. So, and Cyber attacks happen, one person doesn't get attacked, groups of people get attacked. All right, so what do we want to do? We want to create a good security plan. I did forget one there. Right. First thing we want to do is create a good security plan. Why do we want to create a good security plan? So that we're stopping cyber attacks before they start and we know how to deal with them when they happen. All right, that's just as important as knowing what to do after one, after something happens. All right, so good security starts with having clear and consistent policies and procedures. You must define your policies and procedures for your organization. Now, as strange as this may seem to you, the first policy that you should put together is a policy on how to create policies. First time I heard this, I was like, what? And when you think about it, you need to know how you're gonna draft your policy, why you're gonna draft your policy, what it's gonna look like, who can draft your policy, okay? In our company, most of the policies get drafted by either the partners or myself. All right, the reason for that is we're the ones who know the lay of the land the best. Procedures, on the other hand, generally get drafted by the heads of each department. Okay, so if you have a procedure that has to do with IT, it might be me. If we have a procedure on how to notify a customer, it probably is going to be someone from the sales and promotion department because they best know the customers and know how to notify the customers. All right, now, there are all kinds of different standards and frameworks to keep in mind when you're creating these. Um, I'm not gonna go into detail on those, although I, I am gonna say if I hit anything here that seems a little complex and you don't wanna ask me about it in front of all these people, please feel free to come to me afterwards, get a card. I'll be happy to talk to you after this. Okay, first, first thing that you do when setting up security is harden your passwords, okay? Here's the top 50 computer passwords as of last year. Every one of these screams the same thing, laziness. People are inherently lazy, okay? So your job when creating a good security plan is to stop laziness. All right, numbers, QWERTY, password. Interestingly, two of these here, Sunshine and Liverpool, tells me that there are a lot of lazy Beatles fans out there. <laughs> okay, so 
numbers, letters, all that. In addition, you must always make sure you change the default password on any equipment. I, I assume everyone here has an internet connection at home and in the office, right? What is the first piece of equipment that touches the internet? What is your perimeter? It's your router, okay? How many of you by hands have gone in and changed the default password on your router? Oh, this is good, because usually it's not that many people. I tend to speak to a lot of doctors, they're the worst. Okay, this slide is of the Mirai botnet. This is something that went out, a bunch of scripts that knew the default password for every router out there. Went in, took it over, and started using it for other nefarious purposes, breaking into computers, whatever it is, all right? Look at all these numbers, all right? Rough guess, that's probably about 50,000 routers compromised. This was early on. This was 2017, this picture. This botnet was gone. It was actually taken down by the FBI. Other ones have followed, though, because people, even today, do not change default passwords. If you have, <clears throat> sorry, if you have a switch, if you have a firewall, Anything you get, chances are it's going to have a default password. One of the most important things you need to do, change it right away. Before you deploy it or as soon as you deploy it, change that default password. Antivirus, anti-malware. It's a cute slide I picked up from Komodo, one of the security companies that talks about how antivirus works. Basically, antivirus will look at any file on your computer. As you go to open it, it scans it, checks if it's okay, either lets it through or blocks it. Same thing with incoming web connections. If you have the higher end ones like Symantec, they'll list, it'll watch your ports, it'll let you know. This is very important, but again, remember, no one thing is going to help you. Spoke about social engineering in the last slide. I want to talk about one thing, a very interesting case that happened a little while ago. And I actually knew the guy who was working at the company where this happened. They took a bunch of USB keys. They wanted to infiltrate this company. They took them and they scattered them out in the parking lot. These were compromised USB keys. People, employees, picked them up, brought them inside, plugged them into their computer to see what they were, instantly infected their computers. The company was compromised, they did have a data breach. Okay, so one of the things you're going to want to do in your security plan is to think about social engineering, train your employees, but also you need to lock down your computers. USB keys are a very, very simple way of wreaking havoc. So if you don't know where the USB key is from, Please don't ever insert it into your computer. Updating your software and your firmware. Okay, Microsoft Office needs to be updated. You probably know about that. Microsoft Windows needs to be updated. You probably know about that. Your router has firmware that needs to be updated. Your switch might have it. If you have a storage device, a network attached storage, something like that, it needs to be updated. Every single piece of equipment that you have on your network runs some kind of software. And chances are it needs to be updated. So make sure that you know, first of all, where to find the updates. All right, it's probably the website. If you are lucky, you can sign up for an email from the company that will tell you that's something new is there. A lot of websites have what's known as an RSS feed, which is a data feed, and you can get what's called an RSS reader. That basically it checks these things, and if something new comes up, it gives you a notification. That's what I do. I get them from the government. I get them from Cisco. I get them from Drupal, a whole bunch of different things. The government is a great source. NIST. Um, I forget what it stands for now, I apologize. But you can sign up for government emails 
and they come out pretty regularly, we get them every few days, that will tell you that a piece of software, a piece of hardware, something has a vulnerability, and you should get the new version of the software and update it. Please remember, if you take nothing else away today, remember this. Security is never static. It is not set it and forget it. You have to constantly be on your toes. You have to be monitoring things. You have to see what's new. Because believe me, there's a lot more of them out there, nefarious actors, than there are us sitting here in this room taking care of our companies. So now let's get into the guts of it. Okay, the next three slides are going to be a little complex. We're going to spend a little bit of time on each, but this is the important stuff. Here are some of the things you need to consider when creating a good security plan. Okay, harden your server operating system. What does that mean? That means you have a server there. It's probably running Windows Server 2012, whatever it is. You have to make sure that you've got all the latest updates. You have to make sure that Windows Defender is running. You have to make sure that your antivirus is running and up to date. Same thing with your workstations. If you have a firewall, which if you have more than a few people in your company, you should probably have one. You have to make sure that by default, unless you've specifically said you can do something, your people can browse the web, so we open the web ports. Your people can check email, we open the email ports. Everything else has to be denied. You cannot assume the best. You always have to assume the worst in security. Um, if you have a web server, if you're hosting a web server or someone's hosting it for you, you'll want to find out it must be set into tiers. You never want your web server and your database server in the same machine. You want it to be hardened, and you want it so that if someone gets to the web server, they can't necessarily get to the database server. All right, those are called tiers. You may have three tiers, a web server, an application server, a database server. Whatever it is, those need to be hardened. Two-factor authentication. A lot of you probably do online banking. A lot of online banking companies give you these little key fobs that have a number that changes every 30 seconds. I have one with me that we actually use for the office. Looks like this. It's very simply a, a six-digit number. It changes every 30 seconds. So there are now two things that I need to gain access. I need my password and I need this number. It's much harder to replicate this number than it is to steal someone's password. So that's something you may want to consider, especially for financial. We, um, remove default accounts. Okay, so much like um, changing your default password, there are also default accounts that you might want to get rid of. Um, I'll stick with Windows, since most people know Windows. All right, what is the one account that every Windows server has? Administrator. The quickest and easiest thing you can do to stop people from hacking your administrator account is change the name of administrator. It can be done, it's a little beyond the scope of this, but if you do a Google search on how do I change the name of administrator in Windows, Microsoft has step-by-step -step instructions. It takes a minute. And if you have a Windows network, you do it once and it changes it on every computer. All right, so no one can hack into administrator if it's not called administrator. Um, where are we? Closed unused network ports, a little technical. Enforce strong password policy. So I started to get at this before when I showed the password slide. A strong password should be Minimum eight characters long, an uppercase letter, a lowercase letter, a number, a special character, and it must not be based on a word. All right, if I was giving this talk to you in 2012, 
I would say, oh, a great way to do this is take an eight-letter word, change some of the letters to numbers, to, to symbols that look like it, and you've got a secure password. Oh, well, that doesn't work anymore. There's too much computing power out there, and when people are trying to brute force passwords, that substitution is too easy to do. So you have to come up with a password that is long, that is not just a word, and hopefully that means something to you that you can remember. Another important thing, don't write down your password on a post-it note and stick it to the bottom of your keyboard. I can't tell you how many people do that. You have a keyboard tray, you pull it out, you lift it up, the password's here or there. I, I went to a group meeting not too long ago for a, a particular group. All the main seats were taken, but there were some workers' desks around there. I sat down at the desk, there was a post-it. Account, password, account, password, account, password, account, password. I took a picture of it. I wish I had thought to put it in this. I didn't at the time. I, you know, I, of course I would blacked out all the passwords, but literally I had every password to this company that was sitting there on a post-it note on a computer, and this was a manufacturing company. Um, patch known vulnerabilities, um, as I said, you have to keep up with um, patches, changes, updates as they become available. Segregation of duty enforcement. Now this one is something a lot of companies don't necessarily think about, but only your IT people should have access to your servers. Okay? Joe in accounting does not need the password to your main server. If you have a website and you have a guy that develops on your website and you have an IT guy that is in charge of the website itself, the developer should not be able to upload stuff to the website, that should be the IT guy, because that's not his job. You have to segregate the duties, you have to give everyone the right permissions for what they need to do for their job and nothing more. This helps prevent accidents more than anything else. It is so easy to accidentally delete something get rid of something, overwrite, change something that you didn't mean to. So why even make it possible? Um, least privileged is the same type of thing. Okay, logging. CM logging, DLP enforcement. These are two of the same things. So you have all these computers in the office. They all do all kinds of things and they generate all kinds of logs. What are you doing with those logs? Probably nothing. What you should be doing is having some sort of logging server out there that's capturing all these logs. Why? Because at some point something's going to go wrong. Don't assume everything's always going to be okay. When something goes wrong, you need to have these logs and you need to be able to go through them to help determine what happened. If a hacker breaks into your network and you have all of these logs, you're going to see the progression from firewall to switch to server to workstation, whatever it is, and it will help you find out what happened so you can stop it from happening again and possibly even reverse it. At a bare minimum, you will at least know what was touched. DLP, Data Loss Prevention. Now this is a pretty important one if you have any data that you care about on your computers, which I assume is most people. DLP stops your employees from accidentally or on purpose sending out information that you that shouldn't be leaving the company. DLP, data loss prevention, you can have it stop stopping you from going to known compromised websites. You can have it stop and recognize when someone is moving um, a file with 3,000 social security numbers in it, in it from your network to their local computer. You can have it alert, you can have it stop. Whatever it is, these are all things that you want to do. Let me just check the time, okay. 
here's how you harden security. Security should never be thought of as a single thing, and you should never have only one protection in place to stop any given thing from happening. You want to have layers. Okay? At the outside, you have your perimeter controls. Okay? This is the part that hits the network. All right? So from there, you want to test your firewall, make sure it's good. Um, you want to check that everything is up, that it's secure. Next layer you want to have, as we just talked about, your separation of duties. Um, you want to make sure that people adhere to your procedures. You're going to want to put together procedures, you know, for what each person should and shouldn't be doing. Um, business continuity and disaster recovery and testing. I'm going to come back to that in a little while, but you want to, at least once a year, have some sort of a test. What happens if? All right, we do once a year, we say there's a flu pandemic. It starts today. And we go through a simulation for two weeks of what's happening in the business. Now, you know, this person's out, that person is out. We actually draw lots. All right, a third of the company has the flu because it's a pandemic. How do we operate the company without them? And we simulate it, and it, it takes a half hour each morning. You know, this person's being brought in to cover this person, we're hiring consultants to do this. It helps because when we do have real disasters, like Sandy, all right, I'm, I'm sure everyone here was affected in some way by Sandy. Well, we have our planning and everything in place. We were up in about a day and a half, two days. We had email the first, pretty much the first day. We were in a new location, up and running. Within two days, it worked out, I wouldn't say great, but a lot better than it could have if no one was prepared for anything. Business continuity is a document that you put together saying if the lead people in the company, the owners, the tier one managers, something happens to them, all right, your CEO dies of a heart attack tomorrow, what's the plan, sorry Pat, what's the plan to carry on the company without that person? All right, these are all things you need to do. You need to have a resource inventory, all right? Know what you have. If your company, if something happens to the building where your company is located, what will you need to buy, rent, lease, whatever, to get back up and running and to continue your business? Um, so host security, web application hardening, all the rest of that, again, is more technical, but it comes back to the same thing. You need to know what you have. You need to know what you're going to do if you suddenly don't have it. Okay, so I mentioned data loss protection. Data can be in one of four states. Data can be in use, which is right now. You're seeing it, so obviously it's not encrypted. It's there in front of your face. Data can be in motion. That means it's getting from the web server, let's say, to your web browser. All right? There's a certain type of encryption that should be used there. There are certain minimum standards that should be used. Data at rest, you want even more encryption. If your data is sitting on your hard drive, your hard drive should be encrypted. All right? My hard drive at work is encrypted. My hard drive at home is encrypted. It's not hard to do. It's built into most operating systems. And even if it's not, there are free programs that will encrypt your entire drive. And it's just a matter of typing in one password when you boot up. After that, it's completely transparent. So it's worth the extra 10 seconds every time you boot to make sure that if something happens to that data, someone breaks in and steals your computer, they can't get at that data. Right? Data disposed. That means you don't need it anymore. All right? What do you do with your hard drives when you don't use them anymore? You should be contracting a shredding company to shred your hard drives. It costs a couple of bucks. Don't throw your hard drives out. Even if you've wiped them, the data can still be gotten 
unless you've gone through a very, very secure wipe. And with the size of today's hard drives, those wipes take a week to run. All right? Paying the two bucks to get the hard drive shredded costs a lot less than the loss of productivity while you're watching the drive go by for a week. All right. So you have all your plans in place. Okay? Now, this is going to take a while. I got to tell you, getting all the plans in place is not a quick thing. It's not a one day thing. It's a commitment because there's a lot of them that have to go into place. And again, if you have any questions, see me afterwards. I'll be happy to get in touch with you, let you know what kinds of things you need. So here is a snapshot. We have a system that we use that checks every one of our machines every night. They come in in the morning and I can check each of the machines. So this happened right after Patch Tuesday. The second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft releases patches. All right, so this is the Wednesday after Patch Tuesday. All right, so there's new, new software updates, new vulnerabilities, they all need to be patched. So we go in, we do all the patching, poof, this is my computer. Completely patched, clean and green, and it will always be because I am the most paranoid person you will ever meet when it comes to security, except when it comes to things like watching TV. So like my Netflix password is my wife's name. It's in all lower case, and it's, you know. But I don't care because they're not gonna get anything from me on that. If they steal my Netflix account, okay, I can't watch some TV show. I'm not worried about that. But you wanna know my password for my machine at home? You better be ready to write something down that's about that long. Here's another program that we use that just monitors. All it does, it monitors and it lets me know what's going on. So in this case, R1Soft is our backup program. This is telling me that on two machines, there was a critical problem, and here's one of them, with the backup that particular night. All right? It happens sometimes. Um, most of the time, the fix is just go back into the backup program and say backup again, and it fixes it. But sometimes there's problems. I'm backing up two to three hundred machines per night. So if only two or three went bad in a given night, it's not always the worst thing in the world. When you come in and the entire thing is red, that's a different story. Fortunately, most days we don't. We come in, we check the logs, we check everything. There's all kinds of programs and monitoring and everything that happens. This is all real time, by the way. This screen stays up on one of my screens in a browser all day, every day and I will instantly get notified, um, instantly, usually within 30 seconds. They ping, it takes about 30 seconds to ping back and forth if there's a problem. All right. This is one where everything's working properly. Okay, Everything is okay here. My disks are good. The load on the server is good. Memory is good. The mail queue is good. The right number of procedures are running on it. Puppet, which is my configuration manager. I actually have a program where we put in what, how each machine should be configured. It runs once an hour, it goes in. If it sees any deviation at all, it puts it back to where it should be and notifies us. All right? This has saved an incredible amount of time in our company. If you have a whole bunch of computers that do similar functions, all right, a configuration manager can save you an incredible amount of time. These are the websites running on this, all good. Ping means we can talk to it. SSH means I can get to it. That's secure shell, so that's how I get it. Scheduling consistency. Okay, as an important part of verification, you need to make sure that you are checking that everything is good. These tickets, every single one of these, triggers every three months in our company and someone in usually my department, not all of these in my department, but usually someone in my department has to check each of these things. All right? We check the third party accounts, Facebook, whatever it is, to make sure that only the right people have access and are accessing it. Active Directory is all of our usernames and passwords. Go through every three months. Has someone left the company? All right, is their account disabled? Oh, it's not. It should have been. So number one, we do it. Number two, we find out through our ticketing system who claims they did it and talk to them about 
why it isn't that way. If they've been gone for six months, we then delete their account. All right, the same thing with application uh, accounts, database access, our door access system, which is done through a key fob. Every type of access that we have gets verified four times a year. This is our tracking management. Now, here's an interesting one. This is not all of them. This is some of our vendors. All right, you may use some of them as well. CDW, Dell, HP, IBM, um, Cablevision, now Altice. It's an old slide. Um, these are every one of our vendors. In it, we list how important they are on a scale from 1 to 10, operations, business, data, movement, things like that, to determine how critical each of those vendors is. The more critical those vendors are, the more we make sure that we have information from them that they're doing something like this. All right, if you have Fios or Cablevision or Lightpath or any of them as your internet provider, and your company absolutely needs internet, you should find out from them that they have something in place. What happens if I go down? What's your backup plan to get me up quickly? Okay? Because they're hypercritical to you. And if they're down, you're down. So any company that's really critical, you should be making sure that they have all of these security plans in place. I spoke earlier, this one's hard to see, but I spoke earlier about our pandemic simulation. This is actually one of our pandemic simulations. I can't read on these. All right, so basically the pandemic simulation, let me talk about it for a minute. All of the managers get in a room. We have every member of the company, every employee is written down on a slip of paper. Paper goes into a hat. We say, okay, we have 30 employees right now. We're a relatively small company. We're just really good at what we do. We have 30 employees in the hat. We're picking 10, 11, whatever we decide. Normally it's 30 to 35 percent. So it'll be 10 or 11. We pick them out. Boom, boom, boom. Take the hat. We open them up and we record them. We let the managers know number one. Okay? Manager knows who's out. We send out an announcement to the company. Right? This is my job. We will, beginning, we will be beginning our pandemic simulation on Monday, blah, blah, blah. It will run through the following Friday. Generally, that's what we do. We will let you know that morning who's out. Okay, so there's no warning ahead of time, just like there wouldn't be in a pandemic. I get in, I'm always, I'm a morning person, so I'm always in the office before everyone else. I get in 8 o'clock. I send out the emails. Every email starts with the title Pandemic Simulation so that you don't take it as gospel. Pandemic Simulation, the pandemic has started. These are the people who currently have the flu. Boom, 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 boom. Off it goes and it begins. By uh, 9 o'clock the managers start coming in, they look, they say, oh, such and such is called in sick, they sound really bad. I'm shifting their workload to this person, this person, and this person, or I'm calling X client to find out if we can let times slip, or I am about, I, I need to contact XYZ vendor about getting some extra support, programming support, financial support, whatever it is. We already know who these people are because we have them in our policies and procedures. If we need programming help, this is a vendor that can have people up to speed and help us. If we need IT help, we can go here. All of these things are in our policies. This goes on for two weeks and then, you know, miraculously everyone gets better. But it's a great exercise. Um, the first time we killed off a couple of people, just because we could. Um, so I, I was one of the first ones to kill off one of my employees. He didn't find it as funny. Um, but, you know, it, it added to the challenge, okay, now 
we not only have to worry about how are we dealing with this in the short term, all of a sudden I'm missing a person. And I still had another person out sick, and at that point I, it was me and three others in the department. So half the department is out, one of them permanently, so I have to worry about hiring and training and all of that. And this, this helps so much when you have a real problem. Right? Last year, we had some real flu problems. I don't know about everyone else, but we ran into major flu problems. A lot of people had it and they were out. We already knew how to do it. Oh, yeah. All right, so we do this like the pandemic simulation. Boom, 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 and we're done. All right, summary slide. It's been five minutes longer than I wanted to. Okay. Security hardening. You need to protect your exterior. You do that by changing your passwords, right? Getting rid of accounts that you don't need. General hardening. Data loss prevention. You need to protect your information. You want to make sure that whether it's accidentally or through a disgruntled employee, your company sensitive information is not getting out there to where it shouldn't be. Monitoring. You need to know what is happening in your network, on your systems. Consistency. You have to come up with your policies and procedures. You have to make sure everyone follows them. When I first started at Millennium, the first thing I said was, you need anything done by my department, I need a ticket in the ticketing system. Don't even think of coming to me unless I can track it in the ticketing system. The account executives tried to get me fired that day. Fortunately, management was behind me, because they understood how important it was to have consistency. Measurability. If you don't know what's good, you won't know what's bad. So you have to establish a baseline, and that goes back to that monitoring. <laughs> and finally, preparation. You need to know what to do in an emergency, not in some ethereal way, but because you've practiced it. Anyone have any questions? Please. You mentioned the inclusive situation. Yes. Did you have your workers work remotely? Um, no, no, no. We actually, we, we do the work. We just simulate it. So it, it's not like, you know, no one's actually not performing. It's like a parallel universe. But if someone's sick, why don't they just work from home? No, no, no. When, when we say, no, when you talk about a pandemic illness, you talk about people being knocked out to the point. Now, some people do go that route. They spend two or three days where it's like, I can't work. And then the next day is like, well, I'm still not feeling well, but I'm feeling good enough to work, and I will work from home. But again, that's up to you to decide what the parameters are, you and your employees together. You know, the point is to simulate it as close as possible to what you think actually will be happening. Please. I, uh, I wanted to send this person a, uh, a spreadsheet. And he didn't have a personal computer. He only had his company's computer. But he has a personal directory. So I emailed him with a, what's known as a, a CSV file. Mm -hmm. That's a common delimited yeah, file. Yeah, common. Right. Okay. His, cur his computer never heard of a CSV file, and they, it wouldn't let it through. I said, well, you work with spreadsheets all the time, right? Right. Well, I'll just send you the spreadsheet. No, you can't send the spreadsheet. So, but he needed this, this data from me. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, a CSV file is a text file. I'm going to send you the CSV file, but change the, the uh, extension. extension from CSV to TXT. And then when you get it, just change it back. Right. That worked. I am now officially a hacker. <laughs> that's not a hacker, that's common sense. <laughs> um, all right, so. How we deal with things like that yeah. is we don't email. We have a system set up that accesses, has access to the server. And we log in, we put the file that we want to send on the server, we click on that and we do create link. It asks you for a password, so you put a password in. You now have a link you can send to someone and a password that lets them download that file to their browser. Okay? Now, again, if there's any, especially if there's anything sensitive in those numbers, you probably shouldn't just be sending them a CSV file anyway. Yeah. All right? If it's anything at all sensitive, 
at a minimum, you should be sending them a password at Excel file, or zip it up and put a password on the zip file. All right. When I have to send somewhat sensitive information, all right, we do promotions for companies. We have to send the winners. We take the spreadsheet and put a password on the spreadsheet. Then I use a program called 7-Zip, which creates zip files, but it's heavily encrypted. It's called what's called AES-256 encryption, it's government-level encryption. We encrypt that and put a password on it. Then we create the link, which also has a password. I send the link out to the person saying, you're going to get three more emails from me that will, in order, be the password to the link, the password to the zip file, the password to the Excel file. Then I send three separate file, um, emails to them that nowhere have the word password in them that have the passwords. So, you know, probably not what you need to do for a simple CSV file, yeah. but generally speaking, you don't, you have to remember email is straight text. It's out there, anyone can sniff it, anyone can steal it. Don't send anything you don't want published to the world via email. Yeah, you know, again, it may not be the case with what you were sending, but generally speaking, don't send unencrypted data through email. But yes, and welcome to the world of hackers. <laughs> Please. How often do you recommend Minimum every 90 days. All right, and we enforce that through our Windows Active Directory. There are a bunch of settings you can put into group policy. Minimum length, minimum complexity, maximum age. You can change, you have to change your password every 90 days. You cannot change it more than once a day. Am I being thrown off? No, no, still have a couple no. minutes. Okay. No, you're good. Any additional questions for the speaker? Please, yeah. How do you um, verify um, the data integrity of like a thumb drive? Well, the only way you can really 100% verify data integrity is knowing what's there to begin with. So if you know what's there to begin with, and you, for instance, you bring it somewhere else and you compare it to what's there afterwards, then you verified integrity. Um, something, I, I give a lot of talks to doctors. When you talk to doctors, there are three things you have to know of about data. You have to make sure it's secure, it's accessible, and it has integrity, right? Integrity is very important, and a lot of people overlook it. Integrity talks about something being integral, which means it's being whole. So if, when we talk about data integrity, we, talk of, we mean that by saying no, any small piece of it is missing. So data integrity is important. So a lot of times, there are programs that do what's called hashing of data. You can take a file, and it creates a string, a numeric string, that almost no other file in the world will have that same string. So if I'm, for instance, I have to FedEx you a thumb drive, for instance. One of the things I will do is do a SHA hash of each of those, send them to you via email, say, here's the hashes of each of those files, please check to make sure that you get the same ones when you receive the file. So there's one way of making sure that you have data integrity. Anyone else? Bueller? Bueller? No? Okay. Thank you, everyone.